So we are recording. Take it away. Cool. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, today or in the next hour, I want to talk about not so much about technology, not so much about hosting or Drupal or things I usually talk about. I want to talk about ourselves, like how we work or specifically how I work. Um, as you will see later, I've been quite active, I've been quite busy and especially in environments where there's a lot of work and people always ask me like, how do you do this? Like, how do you work that much? And I would actually not say I really have worked that much, but I guess I've worked just very efficiently. And so um, I decided to make a session about this. Um, and it's really also to start the discussion about these type of uh, topics, because I really think while it's great that we talk about code and sharing and technology and design and project management, I think we should also talk a bit more about ourselves being humans. And um, yeah, so that's a little bit my contribution to this topic. Uh, yeah, my name is Michael Schmidt, um, or people also know me as Schnitzel um, in the interwebs. And yeah, so about myself, I'm originally from Switzerland. So, um, but I live in the US now and I had the, the chance last year to actually travel in an Airstream, which I'm in right now, um, all over the US uh, with my girlfriend and my dog. And um, of course we, ex we explored the, the snowy parts of the US, uh, snowshoe, uh, snowshoe wandering um, around. Right now though, I live in Virginia and um, that's more on the right side where if it's good weather, I will go fishing also with my dog again. You will see more pictures of my dog. So yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, now, where do I, what is my experience in, in working? Um, so in Switzerland, it's quite common to do apprenticeships, meaning you actually join a company for four years and you learn a job on the go. And what I really learned during that time is what work really means. You know, you're in school and you always think about how work is going to happen later. And I guess that's really from when I was like 16 to 20 years of my life, I really realized, okay, what that work really means. It can be very stressful, but it can also be absolutely boring sometimes. While I felt school was always pretty much the same, I realized that work is vastly different day by day. Like every Swiss male, I was asked to go to the military and I actually ended up being a first lieutenant in the Swiss Air Force. Um, mostly because I saw a lot of improvements. And if you point out or if you show improvements, um, how things could be done better, you pretty easily end up in officer school. And that's what I did. And I really realized in one year that not so much that I really liked the military. Uh, that's not really what it was about. It was more about leading people. I realized that being responsible for other human beings is actually something I really enjoy. I was responsible for around 30 people, sometimes 200. Um, and if I forgot to order food, my whole company didn't have food on the next day. So that's something I really learned there that, um, that I like being in charge and also be responsible for other things. And then after the military, I joined the MAC lab. So at that point now it's called the MAC group because we have multiple companies and I'm the CTO there. And I would say I'm still learning every single day. And, but my experience that I'm going to talk about is mostly about how I handle being a CTO at, an, uh, at a, an, a group company like we are. So what, are, what am I doing at the amazing group? I pretty much have three jobs. Now, I usually do not suggest people to have three jobs. Um, so that's maybe one of the things I don't do myself really well, but oh well, so it is. And um, yeah, so first of all, I'm a board member of the amazing group and some of the amazing subsidiaries, meaning there, I'm a lot involved in steering the really, really big questions. Um, where are we going next year, the year after that? So it's more about um, these type of things. Then I'm also the CTO of the whole group. They are more focused on security IT strategy. So more a bit shorter term things, but still strategy in that things. And then I'm also the CTO of the Amazi itself, of Amazi.io itself, which is the hosting part of the group and also part of the management. 
and so there I'm sometimes daily hands on. I'm sometimes getting up quite late or early in the morning because we are a global team, um, but I'm also doing architecting and I have also some people that are working with me that I'm the lead of. So yeah, so you can see my job can be quite demanding. And that's how people always ask me, like, how do you do this? And that's basically what I wanna talk about today. How am I handle these sometimes stressful days? Um, how do I structure my days? And maybe there's something that works for you. But I wanna acknowledge a couple of things first. So things that work for you, uh, work for me, might not work for you. We're all vastly different. We have different jobs, different environments, different situations. So please don't take everything you hear today as this is the only way. It is one way and it works for me. And also that the things that work for me right now, they maybe don't even work for myself in a year. Um, so that's the other thing. There's a constant change and constant adaptation of things. And so that's the thing. And the last thing, and I know this is a hard one, or this is unfortunately for some people that I really love my job. Um, I'm very um, happy and I'm definitely um, fully aware that this is a privilege that I can also change my job if I want to. And so, yeah, please look at it from this side. And I really hope that if you are maybe not in a job that maybe this gives you a way also to make your job that you maybe don't so much like maybe to one that you like a bit more because it's easier to handle the job. So these are basically things that please look at them from this side. All right. So one of the things that I do, or one of the things that I'm doing since multiple years, I have two quotes that, um, that I try to remind myself pretty often. The first one, this is the cheesy one, but the only constant life is change. And I think I can definitely say that. I never had a job for more than roughly a year um, because I realized that even though that a new job is maybe super cool and interesting, even the best job gets after two to three years, honestly gets really boring or it gets to be the same. And so I realized I'm happy in change, not constant every single day, but of course, if things don't change or if things stay the same, it's not something that I really, um, that I'm happy in. And that took a bit to understand this. And, but now that I know this, I also know that if I realize I have times or I overall am happy, that maybe I need to just change a little bit and that can already um, make me happy again. And the next one, that's probably because I'm quite an aviation fan, pilot myself, like I said, I was in the Swiss Air Force, is a quote by Henry Ford. And he said, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. And this is a quote that I really have to remind myself um, from time to time, especially in times like right now with a global pandemic or election coming up and things like that, that sometimes you need a bit of resistance. Sometimes you need a bit something against you so you can take off like an airplane. An airplane never takes off with the wind, but against it. And so the, the fact that you have something that goes against you can also lift you up. And this quote really helps me to, if I have a hard time, let's say it's Friday and I had a really stressful week, that looking at this reminds me that next week can get better or I can learn from how this week didn't go well. And we're actually gonna talk a bit about that, about retrospect. So let's jump in. Let's jump in. How do I handle a normal day? But before we actually do that, one of the things that I learned is that the day actually starts with the evening before. So that means I make sure that I have a good prep for the next day. The first thing I do before I go to bed is I check my calendar before going to bed. Now, this is not to freak me out about the next day. It's just about me to know what will happen in the morning. What am I going into in the morning? First of all, I know at which time I have to set my, my, my alarm. I try to get up every single day at the same time, but sometimes I have meetings quite early, so then I, I make sure that I don't forget anything, but also it gives me less stress in the morning because I already know 
which meetings of the next day will be probably more a bit anxiety fueled or which them are going to be fun, things like that. So that really helps me um, getting into the next day prepared. Then, like I said, I try to get up almost every single time at the same time. That's usually around 6 a.m. But I usually get up one hour before the first meeting because this just gives me enough time to get ready. I'm not the person that can get up and start immediately working. Um, I need a bit of time in the morning um, to get a coffee, for example. But um, So I try to do one hour, 30 minutes in extreme cases if it's super early, but that gives me some time. And one thing I just recently started to do, and that's such a tiny thing, but it helps me so much. I prepare my clothes I want to wear on the next day. And I do this just because in the morning when I get up, um, we're going to see the routine that I use later. It's just like the less decision and the less stress I do in the morning, the better my day is going to be. So sometimes I realize maybe I don't have any fresh clothes and I need to wash some, and I need to fold some, and I need to get them somewhere. And doing this before I go to bed and having this stress or this realization is much easier than doing it in the morning when you already slept in the 50 minutes and passed, you're realizing you have a minute in five minutes and then you realize you don't have any clothes. So that's, that's a tiny one, but it's one that quite that actually changed and made it quite better. All right, let's talk about sleep. And actually more about falling asleep. Because one thing I realized that falling asleep can be quite hard, especially if you are in a stressful environment, you're having thousands of thoughts going to your mind and your brain just cannot let go and fall asleep. A lot of times if I cannot fall asleep, it's, more, it's just because my brain is too busy. And so I found two practices that I do that help me fall asleep pretty much within a couple of minutes. And so the first thing I do is I do controlled breathing. Uh, it's, all, it's called the 478 method. There's other ways that are very similar. If you do meditation, that's also very similar. But basically what I try to do first is while I lie in bed, I try to feel my own pulse. Now, this is something that I didn't realize at the beginning, but you can actually just without touching like any of the points of where you can feel your pulse, but just with lying in bed, you can actually feel your own pulse of your heart and your body. So I'm trying to find my pulse and this already takes a bit. And then I breathe in through my nose for four pulses of my own pulse. Then for seven pulses, I hold my breath. This is quite hard. And then for eight pulses, I breathe out through my mouth. And I repeat that two or three times, maybe four or five times. And there's two things that happen. First of all, it really focuses me to focus on myself, on my body. And it also feels a little bit like suffocating. It sounds weird, but um, this is how at least it feels for me. I've talked to pe some people, they said it doesn't feel like for them, but at least that's it for me. But I can immediately feel how my whole body starts to relax. So if I start, let's say with a pulse of 100 um, beats per minute, after a couple of times of these, I can clearly feel how my pulse automatically goes down. So this helps me to calm down, to relax, and to just let go a little bit. Now, some people fall asleep while doing this. This never worked for me. It's way too much concentration on breathing and counting, but at least it helps me to relax. So the next thing I do to actually fall asleep, I count down from 100. And now this also maybe sounds weird, and I also didn't believe this at the beginning, but this really, really works. And fun fact is I do this now since more than five years, and I never reached zero in my life. The, lower, the lowest number I can remember was maybe six. I'm not 100% sure because usually I fall asleep, but I think I had six. This was a bit scary because I worried what happens if you end up zero. I'm talking about this quite often. I met some people that said, oh, I reached zero. I just continued to minus one, minus two. There's an unlimited amount of numbers coming up. So don't worry if you reach zero. But what I believe this is or why this works is that the fact that we are really good in counting up and we don't really do a lot of counting down. So it gives our brain a little bit of things to focus on, but not too much. So it distracts our brain just enough from thinking about 
the next big thing or the ne whatever is um, is creating the thoughts in your brain that you cannot fall asleep. Um, but it forces myself or my brain to focus on one thing that is easy to focus on. And actually, sometimes I count down and suddenly I found myself counting up again and thinking about something else. And so then I have to force myself to count down again. But it's, it's really something that is super easy. Like right now, um, especially when I'm really tired and I go to bed, I maybe count five numbers and I'm asleep. Like it's, it's just super, super easy. And I'm super happy that I found this um, to, to really focus or to fall asleep quite fast. Because that was one of the things that was really hard for me, that if I knew I only have six hours of sleep, and then I cannot fall asleep. That stresses me more out. And uh, so, yeah, that was really good. All right. So then finally we are asleep. And now what am I doing to actually not come out of sleep? Because that's another thing that can happen. So what I do is I put my phone on silent. Shouldn't be surprising, but I'm also turning off all notifications. So if somebody sends me a Twitter message, Slack, um, or whatever, um, they cannot get, or there is no notification, no visual, no audio, nothing. It's just, um, it's not even shown up in the phone. What I tell my team, and like I said, we have a global 24 hour company with servers and customers all over the world. So there are cases where I need it. Um, and we use PagerDuty. So I tell people, PagerDuty, the phone numbers of PagerDuty are white listed on my phone. Um, meaning they can always come through. And so they can always send me a page duty uh, message and they can get through me at any time of the day. You can reach me if you need me. And my team knows that no matter what, I will be there and I will help them. The same also the case for my family. My family actually lives mostly still in Switzerland, which is, um, which means that they are in another time zone. And of course, if they need to reach me for any reason, they can also call. And then I try to sleep usually six hours um, minimum. Uh, less doesn't really work. I can do maybe a day per week. I can do five, but that's at least for me is very hard. I realize that the next day, if I do it for too much, too, too many times a night or a week, sorry, then this, it gets really hard. So usually I get seven. Um, and then on weekends, I do give myself an hour more, maybe two. But one thing I really realized is also that if I try to sleep like on the weekend much more than during the week, this really throws off my schedule. So even though I maybe could sleep for 10 or 12 hours if I want to, it's really something I'm trying to not do because my inner body, the repetitiveness that really helps me staying focused um, is get thrown completely off with this. So I usually try to sleep the same amount then during the week, and that makes it much easier for me. All right, we're sleeping, it's morning. Let's look at a normal day. And now let's actually look at a normal day um, of myself. So I get up and my wake up routine, I try to do every day the same. So the first thing is I snooze my alarm. I cannot, when the alarm goes off, get up immediately. It's not something, so usually I snooze it once or twice. And then when I feel more ready, I read some light Twitter and I know it's a bit of a hard time right now. So I do have a couple of Twitter lists of more like tech news or friends and things like that. So that I'm not already freaked out by what's going on in the world. But that helps me to wake up a bit, get my brain going. Um, but and that's super, super important, at least for me, I do not read any Slack or any emails. And the reason for that is that a lot of times I see something that happened last night or a customer is angry and sent me an email. If I read this at that time, my day is already gone. Like it's already thrown out. It's already like I'm in so much stress or so much hyped up already that because I cannot finish my routine, it's going to be very hard to ever get back to a normal day. So I, that's why I also disable all the notifications. So I don't even see any emails um, on my uh, notification screen or so. Then I get up, I shower. Another thing I do, I feed the dog in the morning. And 
Um, one of the interesting things that I realized is doing something for somebody else in the morning that is super appreciative. If she gets breakfast in the morning, she's so happy. Um, that also makes me happy. So my day starts with something good. Uh, even though the day, I know that the day is maybe going to be hard or there's going to be a really this, um, complex meetings or things like that, I start the day with something happy, having a dog that is super happy and definitely makes it much easier. Then I make coffee. Without that, I probably wouldn't survive. And then I go to my notebook, I open my notebook, and then I'm going to work. And I can read all my emails, I can see the messages, I can see what's going on, I can jump into meetings if I have to, but I have everything around me. I, I'm up, I work already close, I'm not like in my sleeping clothes, I have coffee, that really helps me, and then I can start. And that's something that I do every single day and that really helps me. This half an hour, 45 minutes in the morning where I'm not reading any emails or nothing at all, this really, really make it so much easier. Then breakfast. So you see in this whole list, there's no actual breakfast in there. Now I'm a person that really needs some breakfast in the morning, but I also don't really have time because the problem is if I eat breakfast, I'm tempted to then maybe read my Slack and emails. And so, yeah. Um, so I decided um, to, to, to actually find an alternative. And I found Soylent, which is a drinkable uh, food. And um, I drink it for, for in, in the morning only. So I just do one meal a day with Soylent. And I drink the the coffee mocha version, which also has some coffee in it, which helps me get up even faster. And so that's what I do in the morning because I can drink it. I don't have like a bowl of cereal in front of me that I then type and like eat because that's all really hard. So it's just something I can drink that really did and makes it much, much easier. All right, so that's my wake up routine. Again, super important for me. That really helps me get me through. The next one is about calendars or how I structure my day. On the background, you see one of my calendars. It's quite full um, with having these many different roles. I need to be in meetings quite often, but I really let my calendar rule my life. And so people always ask me, do you have time tomorrow for a call or whatever, whatnot? And I really tell them, look, just send me a meeting invite. You will see my calendar if I have time. If it's something free, I have time. If not, I don't. And what I do is I add blockers in it. So if I want something for, um, to focus on myself, I just put myself a blocker in the calendar and people know don't send my meetings invites during that time. Now my external people that need externally need access to me. Um, they of course don't have access to my, pub, to my private calendar. So I use a tool like Calendly or there are other tools. And um, for external requests, they can send me requests and stuff like that. And then of course, uh, like I said, I block off time. So that's basically how I structure my day. During the day myself, I try to have five minute breaks between meetings. And what I do, I give myself short rewards. So it's really about little treats, little things that I like to do that brings me shortly away from the computer or just like lets my head um, walk around or do something like that. That can be like watch a short YouTube video. I have a couple of channels of like tech stuff that like three, four minutes, perfect. Um, to see people, I don't know, picking locks or things like that. Just silly stuff, but just that shortly gets me out of the thinking. I make coffee, I play with the dog, I shortly go out, we run around, that gets my pulse pumping again. It's really these five minute breaks. Now I cannot do them at, between every single meeting, of course, but having a couple of them per day really helps me. Then the other thing I do, I force myself to get up. One of the things I realized is walking or moving around really helps me also to solve problems. Sometimes I'm really stuck with a problem. I have no idea how to solve a technical problem or a more um, human related problem. And so um, going around and walking around really helps me. The problem is I have so much stuff to do that this doesn't always work or I end up working sitting in front of the computer for four hours. And so what I do is I drink a lot of water and I can tell you your body will take uh, solve that problem by itself because you have to go pee at one point. So I try to drink a lot of water, which forces me to get up. 
go to the toilet. And a lot of times during that time, just walking, moving around, I actually find solutions to problems. And um, I read a bit about that. And there is actually, we believe that there is two different states of our brains where there's more a focused way and more the creative way. And moving around is actually connected to the creative way. So it helps your brain to come out of that focused way with moving around. And, and I, at least I can say that really helps me. Then for lunch, I take bigger breaks. Um, they are usually 30, 45 minutes, not too long, because again, I have a lot to do. And there during that time, I try to do or give myself a big, the bigger reward. I really hate eating in front of the computer and doing work. So I try to step away. And I do like depends on what, what uh, how the weather is, but like if I want to stay inside, I watch a YouTube video again, a TV series or something, depending on my girlfriend, her schedule, may, maybe eat lunch together. And um, if it's a good weather, I go out with the dog and we play a bit longer again. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I do for lunch. And that's another like cornerstone in my day. I'm really looking forward. And I'm really also trying to block always out half an hour, 45 minutes to eat proper lunch. All right, during the day, I need a lot of focus, so I use a lot of music. I pretty much listen to music all day long. Um, I went through quite different types of headphones with uh, noise cancelling, but now I'm... Um, so try to find the headphones that you really like, that you also can wear all day long without um, hurting. And then I have different music playlists. So um, during the day, I actually listen to quite... Like, I have like a playlist of, you know, 100, 200 songs that I really like. And they just play randomly. Um, which, yes, this means I actually listen to the same music a lot of times. But this just makes it easier for me. Because I'm not like, or I know which song that play B is. And that really helps me to give a bit structure. A, I have a, mo a motivational music playlist. If I feel down, that really brings me up. If I'm up for some new music, I use Spotify suggestions. And then for writing, because I'm not a native English speaker. Um, writing is actually quite hard if I listen to music or like podcasts or like music where people sing. So I listen to mostly instrumental music uh, if I need to do writing or um, blog posts or bigger as uh, like messages or so. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how I can focus myself while working. Another thing that I really need to focus is that um, as we're all working from home and mostly environments where other people walk in and out, um, uh, me and my girlfriend actually figured out the way how to tell each other to, that we are busy. Because I look the same in front of the computer if I'm coding, if I watch a YouTube video, or if I'm in a board meeting, it probably looks pretty much the same. So what we have is these uh, small flags, they're called looks of four, but there are also other companies that do similar things. And they're just on our screens and they light up in different colors. Now, if we are, it's red, meaning I'm in a meeting, please do not, um, please do not um, intrude, interrupt me. And so um, if you wanna reach me, text me, send me a text message. A yellow means I'm busy, you can interrupt me, but I would prefer not. And green or it's off, I'm not busy and you can interrupt me. And that really helps us because we definitely had cases where like, Somebody just asks a, a random question and the other person is in a board meeting and that's not so cool. All right, let's go in general about notification. <clears throat> so emails. Um, the first thing I realized a couple of years ago that I don't really need notifications for emails. So nowhere, if you send me an email, I don't get any audio, I don't get any message on my computer, I don't get any not notifications on my watch, because I realized nothing really has been that important in email that couldn't wait for, let's say, an hour or two. My people, my employees know if they need something urgently from me, Slack me. If I don't respond in Slack, send me a page. And um, that's the only way that you can reach me if you really need me. Um, what I do is I check emails in between meetings. Um, I always go from the bottom up. So I look at the last unread one. And I mark each one um, as read when I have read them. If I have time, I try to follow up them right away or not. They use the snooze function of like Google Mail um, to remind me again 
because a lot of times if an email is read, I will probably never really look at it again unless I'm searching for it. So I'm really trying to either respond immediately or snooze it so it comes back on top of the feed. Then another important thing, I strictly separate private from company email. Yes, these unified inboxes are cool, but they don't make my life really much easier. So during the day, I mostly look at my company email. Then in the evening, I look at my private email um, to separate these two things um, as much as possible. And then I'm trying Inbox Zero every couple of months. I delete all or I move all the emails into archive and I'm really proud of myself that I can do it for a day and then I'm failing again. So I have not really figured that out um, how to do it, but oh well, at least I realize I don't really need it. Slack itself, um, I'm really strict in notifications with Slack. Um, so I use them um, mostly, most channels I only have on mention only. So if somebody mentions me, I get notified. Only a few of them, I get notifications for everything. And that's maybe five or six of them that I really want to know. Then threat notifications, we use a lot of threats, but they automatically create notifications. So I usually just disable them or unfollow the threats. And then I group the channels by importance. At Amazi, we have around five or 600 Slack channels that range from every single project to fun ones like a pet channel or a maker's channel or a political channel. And so um, I do them in different groups. I have some of them that I say I want to read all the time that can be custom and internal. I have important internal ones. So that's an important customer ones. I read them whenever I have time. So if I have five minutes, I short to look into Slack and I click through all of them and read them. And then I have a lot of others, which is all the other stuff. And I just read them if I'm bored, but, or maybe sometimes I don't even read them for a whole week, but I know what is going on there is not important for me or if then I will be mentioned anyway. So that makes it much easier to handle this thing. And then if I have a message that comes in and I read and I don't have time to react immediately, I use Slackbot. So like this morning, I had like 10 different messages. I all told Slackbot to remind me three hours later, after lunch, just before the session, I went through all of them, I answered all of them, and all of them have answers. So um, I can check myself and keep make sure. Then of course, there's a lot of other ways how we communicate, iMessage, WhatsApp, and that's more private communication. And most of them I have mostly muted during the day because yeah, they're too distracting and people talking about their, their dog pictures or family pictures and things, it's great, but I'm working, so I don't really have time. Then I can check them in the evening. Now there is a time that I really need to focus 100%. And what I do during that time, I not only put blockers in it, like we talked before, I actually turn off everything. And I went so far sometimes to actually turn off the Wi-Fi or disconnect the Ethernet altogether. And that really, really helps me to focus and give myself really possibility to focus without any distraction. Again. I'm still reachable by a page duty. So my team knows if I say, hey, I'm off, you can reach me by a page. Sure. They can always reach me. And um, if there is something going on while I'm disconnected to the internet, but um, this um, really helps me. And while right now I don't find enough of that time, um, if it's really important, I just put blockers in it and say, hey, I'm signing off. Um, and that during that time, like the two, three hours, I'm always surprised how much I actually get done compared to like all the distractible times with others. All right. So this is basically how I handle my whole week, my days. One other thing is that I realized is that I need to do retrospectives. And the background picture is actually from the Apollo Command Center um, in Houston. And there every, every station had these three buttons that any time they can give status reports. So, is it red, yellow, or green? And I'm trying to use the same thing for myself. And so what I do is I try to choose a specific time that I add that I do retrospectives on myself. Um, a couple of ideas of things I've done in the past is the shower on Saturday, lunch on Friday, a workout on Sunday, but just something that you do every week that when it happens, you remember, oh, I need to do retrospectives. And I basically ask myself a couple of questions. So the first question is, did the positive things of the, of the past week outlie or outweigh the negative things? Now, why not 
why not ask differently? I know that no week will ever be perfect. Of the 50 meetings I have per week, they're probably not gonna be, all of them are gonna be awesome. But what I'm saying is like, or what I wanna know is that more needs to be positive than negative. If that is reached, this is a good week. If that is the case, good. If not, then I'm also checking, um, did I succeed in changing the last week's goal? So we'll see later, I will give myself a goal. And so I will look at, did during the last retrospective, did I, I gave myself a goal, did I succeed it or not? And then I can decide if I want a new goal or the same one. Sometimes I just continue and say, okay, I didn't try hard enough, I will try again. Or if I succeed at the goal, then I can do another one. And important is, <clears throat> Then I will decide what I will do. And this goal can be something super tiny. And then it can be super small. Like I can tell myself I wanna drink more water or I bought myself a water bottle or I wanna drink less coffee or I don't know, um, w listen to this specific podcast or something at all. It can be super, super easy things. But if you think about it, you have 52 weeks per, per year if you change something, tiny things, 50 things over a course of a year, that's a massive change that you can reach. So I think we always underestimate how much we can actually reach in a year. We highly overestimate what we can reach in a day, but what we can reach in a year, it's quite crazy. And so I realized if I, instead of having these big, big goals for the year, that I can change something. Instead, if I look at every week and I change something really small every week, that's gonna be much, much easier than doing these huge changes that really help. And so I do these retrospectives once per week and it just helps me resetting myself because sometimes I'm realizing like I'm not drinking water enough or I'm not doing something that I told myself. And they help me shortly think about myself, think about how it's going. And sometimes, you know, there are huge decisions when I'm realizing I'm not happy with the job anymore or, or there's something going on really bad with an employee or things like that. And they're all okay, but it really helps me looking at that, forcing myself to think about it and then change them in little things. That's it. I know there's a lot, um, but I'm super happy. I saw there's some discussions that went on um, in the chat, that's super cool. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions, go deeper into things I'm doing, shoot along. Thank you. Um, yeah, your dog is adorable. Um, I haven't seen any questions. We've been taught, we were talking about sleep stuff. Um, and Cheryl shared um, that she has a feed that she does on Facebook where she reports memes and she gets like one comment a week saying, thank you for doing this is the only thing. Uh, let's see. The slides, are oh, you just posting them again? Yep. Um, yeah. Did I already ask you if you put your slides on the session page yet? I did not, um, but I will do that. Okay. Cool. And, and there is also there a link, the, you can put them in the body field. Yes, oh, yes they will do. Cool. And then there's, if you want to follow my dog, there's an Instagram of hers. Actually, her awesome. Instagram is better than mine. So, yeah. <laughs> That's usually the case. Uh, so, Stephen has a question. Uh, yes. What do you think would be the best thing? So, there was a lot recommended. What do you think would the best, be the best thing to start for someone who wants to make a change? That's a great question. That's a good point, yes. So for me, how I started really thinking about this, I, let me think. I would say it's the drinking more water actually. Like the change that it caused me to really think more about how it's going on and also improve my my concentration throughout the day and be able to do more was really drinking more water throughout the day. Because A, it gives your body more fuel to work, but also um, these short breaks and getting up and um, they really, really help me. They make me, 
be able to provide much more, even though, yes, I may be actually spending less time in front of the computer because I'm walking around five minutes every hour. Um, but I think that's really the piece that all started it. And then the second one, if you have problem falling asleep, I think the, the changing of falling asleep or the, the, the sleep um, breathing um, methodology, that really helped me. And then the third one, I would think about the morning routine. For me, at least, the mornings are so important about the whole day. So um, yeah, I would try to find a routine that you can follow every single day. Uh, and the last thing is preparing my clothes in the evening. I have just started this a couple of months ago and I'm like, why have I not done this way, way earlier in my life? Because that was really a big change. But a super question. Yeah, I would, I would say that when I've tried, and I know it's not my session, but whatever, I'm saying it anyway. Um, Go ahead. But it's just, you, yeah, you think about what's, which, like you said, for you, like it's what you think is most possible. Because one of the great things is that if you can, if you can have a success, it makes it easier to do the next thing. So, yep. like, you might seem like, oh, this is the easy one. I'm copy. It's a cop out. It's not. It's like, do something that you, you set yourself up for success, right? And then you're more likely to do the next thing. Um, don't don't pick the thing that's going to be the hardest for you. Um, in my opinion. Uh, Karen added, I'd also add that spending time outdoors or just having a view of nature is great for short breaks. It's a nice point. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually oh. one thing I learned once is that looking into green is really good for our eyes. So having the possibility to look outside or looking into the distance, because our eyes, because we sit in front of the computers, we always look the same distance and that's quite bad. And um, so having the possibility and especially looking into something green helps our eyes to relax. So yeah, I'm also trying to please be at a place that I can look outside if I need to think about something or so. That really also helps my eyes to relax and so I can focus again. Uh, yeah, that's a good addition. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, we've got We've got three minutes left. I think we should just hang here and see if anything comes out. Sometimes people having fun or whatever. <laughs> what kind of dog? Um, let me move it over here. So she is a Swiss mountain dog. Um, as a Swiss person, I had to have a dog from Switzerland, of course. Um, she's quite a big dog, so she's like 110 pounds. It's, quite, it's like having a child. She's quite clever, but um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun and it definitely changed. I'm not suggesting anybody to have a dog, but it definitely, it helps me sometimes, especially remote work. It helps me and my girlfriend without, as we don't have any children, to be responsible of something else sometimes. That really helps. It definitely makes a bit your life harder because you need to always think about where does the dog go, what does the dog do. But um, I think overall, it's it definitely enriched our lives a lot. And and another thing I can also suggest is if you're not sure, just foster a dog from a shelter. It's a non-commitment, so you can just have a dog for a couple of weeks and decide if you maybe want one or not. So yes. Yeah, Alison, that's the question usually, like, did the dog go out or not? Always. So. My whole life was, was revolved around that. Yeah. When, when we had a dog. Um, do you, uh, I've always wondered about Swiss mountain dog versus <laughs> has the dog pooped one of the last time I pooped. Yep, Stephen, well put. Um, Bernie's mountain dog versus Swiss mountain dog. Do you know enough about them to tell me the differences? <laughs> yes, yeah, a yeah. lot. <laughs> so there is actually, uh, let me see if I find the image. There is a really good image of all four of them. Um, yeah. They should have been prepped. Well, their hair is longer to start with. 
Correct, yes. So, so you can see the difference. So this is a Swiss mountain dog. They have the shorter hair. And then you have the Bernese mountain dog, they have the longer hair. But that's pretty much the only difference. They come from the same family of the mountain dogs. And oh. um, they, there's two other breeds. There is the Entlebucher that is much smaller. And then there's another one that I don't see here right now. But yeah, the difference between the Bernese and the Swiss is very similar. They are the same size, same intelligence. They're super intelligent dogs. And they're more like, they're working dogs. So if you need to give them something to do, or yeah, they will, they will find something to do. The for Swiss you. or the Bernese? Yeah. Both Just so of them. I know. Both, Both of, them. of them, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were bred for like, actually, um, to pull carts. So they were like the, the poor man's mm. horse of the farmers. So you can, oh, you can wow. teach them how to pull horse, uh, pull carts, like up to like uh, 2000 pounds they can pull. And so, yeah, it's not, it's maybe not the breed I would suggest to have as a first dog, <laughs> but um, yeah, they're great. Um, and especially the Swiss mountain dogs quite rare. Mm. Well, they seem so, yeah. So we are at time. Um, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you everyone for being here right. and sharing in the chat. It was a really nice chat. I hope that folks will continue continue talking. That's the Slack channel. Thank you. Um, the recording will be on the session page within the next few days. I, I can't remember if it's over the weekend or by next week, but pretty soon. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.